Working as the curator of the Glebe House and Gallery and looking after the Derrick Hill collection is a really interesting job, but it has two conflicting roles. The first one to look after the collection and protect it, and then the second one to allow people to have access to it and to use the collection. And you have to find the balance between those two things. The White Cube galleries that we talked about earlier on in these videos are the almost perfect environment for exhibitions. They're really good physical environments because we have a lot more control over the temperature and the humidity and they tend not to have a lot of natural light. So we have spotlights and track lighting and we can light the artworks to make them very easy for you to, to see. Also they're the perfect environment for you, the viewer, because they are um, tidy and uncluttered so the artist has a lot of control over how their work is seen in that space and the curator maybe only adds things that they think will help you understand the art but these white cube galleries are only almost ideal because we don't have as much control over the environment as we'd like to have and also you can't completely separate an art object from its context it will always bring some sort of baggage with it the tea room here, however, it isn't even almost ideal and is far from uh, being a climate control space, but it's also a very cluttered space. So you will find it more difficult to get what you need to get out of an exhibition in an environment like this. But there are huge benefits that come along with it as well. And we'll look at both of those things in this video. One thing that I haven't mentioned very much in these videos is interpretation. And that's a big part of the exhibition environment. It's what will help you to get the most out of the art if you're struggling. And even if you're not struggling, it should add quite a lot to your experience. Let's look at the environment here in the tea room now. And we can see that there are pros and cons to an environment like this, but it's certainly not ideal and it's very difficult to control. And the first thing that we always do with museum environments is just measure them and see what they're like. And we use data loggers in this case, and you might have seen them in some of the videos. In this case, we have this one that measures the light level and the ultraviolet light level. And this one measures the temperature and humidity. And the humidity is the thing that we're probably most worried about and UV light as well. So the humidity at the moment is at 47.6 so it's not bad at all it's a nice that's a nice level uh, the UV level I don't know I'd have to check on my computer and the two images that you're looking at now are images of readings that we took a few days ago there are things that we can do to improve the humidity level once we know what it is we can add moisture to the air or we can remove it using humidifiers or dehumidifiers and we can control the natural light with blinds on the windows and also with an ultraviolet filter. And some of the paintings here also have filtered glass on them for added protection. But because people come and go so freely and because they're drinking hot liquids like tea and coffee, the humidity is going to be uncomfortable from time to time for the objects. And that's something that we need to understand and we need to monitor the objects very closely and make sure that they haven't or that they're not beginning to become damaged. And that's really why the two big paintings were removed from exhibition because they just had enough time in an environment like this and it was time to take them out of it again. Now let's look at how comfortable the environment is for you, the viewer, here in the tea room. Well, I would hope it's very comfortable if you came for tea and buns. But if you came just to look at the exhibition, you might feel awkward not buying something, for instance, or having to look over people who are maybe having a conversation. And I do see people come in and look at the exhibition like that, and they don't seem to find it difficult. But I can imagine some do, and some decide not to look at the exhibition for that reason alone. But it is a comfortable environment. There are lots of seats and you can sit here in front of a picture for a half an hour or longer if you want. And people tend not to do that in galleries. They tend to move quite quickly through galleries and not spend a lot of time looking at something. I would hope that 
if you do spend longer than usual looking at a picture, you'll start to see what's really going on and you'll see things that other people just can't see if they pass things very quickly. And then there's the interpretation that I mentioned earlier. That can be anything that helps you to understand the exhibition. And usually when we talk about interpretation, we're talking about the labels or maybe some text panels on the walls. But it can even be a website or social media or videos of maybe the artists at work. Just anything other than the art, anything extra to the art that helps you understand or make meaning from the exhibition. And this is where exhibitions can fall down or even fail completely. Sometimes the language that artists and curators use is really only understandable to them, to other artists or curators or even critics. And it's difficult for the average person to understand what's being said. And you used to see it a lot. You don't see that as much at all anymore these days, but you still do come across it from time to time. And I'd be very critical of that type of art speak because you might remember I said that you should ask who the story is being told to. And if you can't understand it, then it's fair to presume that the story isn't being told to you. And that should annoy you, it should bother you, because it should be for you. The National Park Service of America have a brilliant phrase that they use to analyse the interpretation of exhibitions. They say that information isn't interpretation. And what they mean by that is that you can't really learn much from the information alone. And if we look at the exhibition here in the tea room, at the labels, really all we've included in those labels is information. We haven't tried to interpret the paintings in any way. In lots of ways you could say that the pictures tell the story in this exhibition because there's very little help other than the pictures themselves. If we just go back and look at the photographs that Derek Hill took on Tory Island, you might remember I spoke about them in one of the earlier videos. I told you first of all that Derek Hill took them on Tory Island. That's information. And then I went on to say that it seems that he took them on his first few visits to the island because they looked like they were from that date and also because he didn't seem to take as many photographs, certainly not photographs of that type, on his later visits. Now that's interpretation. We can't be 100% sure that that's the case. Maybe he took these photographs intending to turn them into paintings. I don't think he did. He never did paint those kind of scenes on Tory Island. But that is interpretation and it helps paint a picture of his time on Tory for you. Going back to the question in the last video about what objects tell the story and how well do they tell the story, let's just look at where the various pictures in this exhibition came from. Most of them come from here, from the Derek Hill collection, but none of them were on exhibition before this exhibition. If this was a gallery exhibition, maybe a temporary exhibition that was running for one or two months, we probably would have taken things out of the Glebe House, the more spectacular paintings like West End Village, but we still would have included the things in this exhibition, like the photographs from Tory Island that we just spoke about. And we have included them in exhibitions in the past, but more to inform the really spectacular artworks. But I wouldn't accept that they're not good enough to stand on their own. And I think this exhibition does show that they are strong and they are fascinating in themselves. But you could criticise the exhibition and say that there weren't enough really spectacular artworks in it to make an exhibition. After looking through our own collection, we looked at what we needed to complete the story of Derek Hill's Donegal. One of the things was we wanted to look at what had happened after Derek Hill had left the Glebe House in the early 80s and his death in 2000. And that's where the contemporary photographs that we looked at in an earlier video come in. We borrowed those from Donegal County Council. They were all made, I think, in the last 20 years. So they really do bring the exhibition up to date. They're also very well made and I think they lift the quality of the exhibition significantly. They're big and they're colourful, which is always nice. But even at that, there were still a few things missing. So we borrowed from private collectors and artists. And those three sources, 
which are quite typical when you're curating an exhibition. You should be able to find some things in your own institution's collection, and then you look further afield for the other things. Finally, examiners like to see that you have analysed individual artworks, and ideally you'd pick them yourself, but in this instance I've picked three quite different pieces in this exhibition, and we'll just look at them in a little bit of detail here now. The first is Garten from Harley's of Glendone, and it was painted by Derek Hill in 1958. That's information. Now we'll get into the interpretation a little bit uh, about this painting. 1958 is just over 60 years ago, so if you had been doing your leave insert then, you'd be in your 80s now. And the road has changed a lot in that time, and the society, the people that live there, have changed a lot too. Derek Hill did sit in front of this and paint it. It isn't imagined or edited, but he stopped to paint it because it was already beautiful. He chose to paint this. And the painting looks sentimental now, but Derek probably didn't see it that way. It was just what was there then. And that sort of sentiment, we're probably adding that when we look at it and imagine what life was like 60 years ago. And we're probably overly romantic. It was probably more difficult than we imagine from looking at a beautiful picture like this. Those are the sort of things to think about when you're looking at a painting like this, how romanticised it is and how realistic it is. Maybe go back and try and figure out what life was like. So I have no doubt that I romanticise this when I look at it. But if I think about Glendone 60 years ago, for instance, I know that there was no electricity there at that stage. So life wasn't ideal. It wasn't beautiful and romantic all the time. James Dixon was already in his 70s when he started to paint and although his pictures look childlike and they're full of energy, he was an old man. Most of James Dixon's paintings were painted from his memory and his imagination. You see stories that people have told him, historical events uh, and bird's eye views of the island and that's quite different from a lot of the other Tory Island artists you might remember I said that they tended to paint just what was there and they repeat the subjects over and over again and that's what's so valuable about their work. James Dixon's very unusual in that whole folk art genre. He did a fascinating thing with his compositions. He often broke them into two different viewpoints and one of them was map-like from the sky, like in the field. And then the second was in profile or looking straight on like in the tractor here. And we regularly see this in his paintings. He also regularly put his titles onto the painting in text boxes. And sometimes they were quite long. And very often they act as the interpretation. And they could be very uh, colourful in themselves. Both of these paintings are views of the past. They were painted in the 50s and the 60s. The Declan Doherty photograph, on the other hand, is much more recent. He took it uh, during the 2011 elections. Declan's a newspaper photographer by profession, so his work is journalistic. He's trying to illustrate something that is happening as it happens. And he doesn't want to pose his work, but it is composed and his photographs have to be well made and they can be very beautiful, but he's interested in what is actually there and in not giving his opinion about it. Of these three artists, you're more likely to have seen Declan's work before because from time to time national and even international news outlets will pick up one of his photographs and run it. So it may well have appeared in your social media news feed from time to time. Well, we've come to the end of this series of videos analysing Derek Hill's Donegal, the exhibition here in the Tea Room at the Glebe House and Gallery. I've really enjoyed making the videos and I've learned quite a lot about the exhibition. I see room for improvement in a few areas and I'm certainly going to improve the labels and add a little bit of interpretation there, maybe add a few more pieces to the show. I hope you got something out of it. I hope you will find it useful in your exams and I want to wish you the very best of luck for your art exam and for all the exams that you're sitting this summer. I hope you do really well. Um, and maybe when it's all over, you'll be able to come here and have some tea and buns 
with us here in the tea room and look at the exhibition for yourselves.